session. Who of you had to practice this particular piece when she or he learned to play the piano? Only me. So no one else learned to play the piano? No, but I had five years of Bach playing the organ. Okay. So the question is, uh, what we will speak about in this presentation is how to find not the music, but the place where Bach lived. So Johann Sebastian Bach, and that's taken from Wikipedia how to pronounce his name. Um, some people say he is the greatest composer ever with the largest influence. Some other people doubt this, but at least as one of the most important composers. And he was born in Eisenach, died in Leipzig, and worked for seven years in Kürten. That's the place where I live. And in that time, he wrote the Well Tempered Clavier, where this is the front page. And what we just heard was taken from the Klavierbüchlein for Anna Magdalena Bach, that was his second wife. And we just heard the tenth piece of this, and here are the notes from his original time. So, during the time when he lived in Kürten, there are still many open questions. And the reason is that after, even during his lifetime, he lost popularity. And only more than a hundred years later, people started thinking of him again. And 150 years later, the research began to find out about his life. So around his 200th birthday, he, um, the, they'd start building uh, monuments and um, wrote books about it. And so since then, the people have been looking for 120 years, where did he live in Kürten? At those days, there, the famous Bachhaus in Eisenach was found, and a couple of years later they found out no way that he could have lived in that house. So when you go to Eisenach, which is the most famous uh, Bach museum, and they tell you it's the Bachhaus, he did not live in the <laughs> So Curtin is a city in a very old cultural area, so human culture has been traced back to the Ice Age because since then the area is very fruitful and um, uh, so you found find cultural elements like uh, in, in the greater area from many many years so 3,000 and plus years and 10,000 years and etc etc the city itself has been mentioned almost 900 years ago and was the capital of an independent state a micro state in Germany. Germany had states with 20,000 inhabitants, or 15,000 and less. So, and uh, Anna Kürten was one of them. And today it has, the city has about 30,000 inhabitants, has a university, and was the home of the so far largest ESAC ever. So Amsterdam tries to beat Kürten this year, so if you all go to Amsterdam, on top of the people that are there anyway, Amsterdam will be good, otherwise not. So, uh, one of the most important princes of Curtin was uh, Prince Leopold, and um, he, le he was the guy who employed Bach to come to Curtin, and that's one of the pictures. He might have looked like this, so it's taken from the picture. The reason why we, why, we, why we were quite involved with this is that there is a society called Kürtner Bachgesellschaft and they want to attract more tourists and set up a project to attract more <coughs> investment around tourism because the area has uh, problems in terms of economy and uh, so that's why it, the, it's a project like this got funded and it had two goals. First goal was to improve tourism and the second one is to find as much information like, as tangible for tourists to work on. 
It was sponsored by the uh, public money uh, from the European Union, the state, the county, and the city. And the most important question was, where was his home? There were more, uh, so there were more questions to be answered, but the other the questions was sort of, so if we don't find it, we want at least some results. That was the kind of questions. So that is the report that got ended. So that's the English version of the report called Feasibility Study about the further development of the tourist infrastructure in Curtin with reference to the area of work and life of Johann Sebastian What a long time. So, and then this agency did a bidding, and we won it together with uh, Anarch University. So, you learned yesterday that I am uh, the executive director of STIC, but that doesn't make me living. So, I have a company founded 21 years ago, and uh, we are doing small talk and only small talk for all that time. Uh, we have three locations one is in Dortmund, one is that's our office building in Dortmund. One is in Kirkman, and this is our office building in Kirkman. Actually, it's not an up-to-date photograph. And um, our current mission, so that's actually the third mission in our company life. The first one was to spread small talk in Central Europe. The second one was to make projects successful, and now our mission is excellence and innovation. And this Bach project falls under, under this category. The project was started, that was when the bidding started, uh, a little bit more than uh, two years ago and was completed in February of this year. We split the process into four phases and used agile method methodology to be successful. And in the very early beginning, we said, we knew up front that if we did the same methodology, all the historians, the much more intelligent story than a computer company can provide, did that looking for a piece of paper with an address would fail. Because that, if that paper, piece of paper exists, someone else would have found it and published about it. So we said we have to do things that only computer can do. And uh, so you know maybe that the four color problem uh, was solved using a computer mathematical proof. So we did similar approaches that, a similar approach and said, we want to use the, um, um, the exclusion as a decision process. That was one of the things we knew up front. So that has to do with mathematical or with criminology gene and nothing with history. history. Uh, but that forced us to be, do a very broad data collection, otherwise you can't do that. So in phase one, we did drilled out of questions and did priorities. Phase two, based on phase one, we went out with a whole team of about 30 people to collect all kind of literature, document figures in archives, bookshops, eBay, libraries, wherever, and scanned all of the material. OCR did, and um, copied handwritten text in old handwriting and um, did all this into a computer. So this, uh, these were the total things we collected. And we selected because it's a lot of work to, to, to copy handwriting. <laughs> so overall, we did about between uh, 50 and 70% of the material we put, put in the computer. And uh, so the total of 14,000 pages were there, and 8,000 were made available and put in the data. Now, phase three started. Phase three was to do something with that data. So, and the way we did it, we built up a semantic network with search of functionality. And uh, based upon the relevant text code documents, so we wanted to keep traceability. So, the, the software provides that when you find something, you go, can go back to the find reader set or to the Word document and to the image that you really see whether everything is okay. We did something very special, so we copied all the tax records of this city for about 100 years to find, because that was the most reliable information about the city structure. We wanted to find a house, so we 
did the city's tax records, property tax actually. And first of all, there were exile tables. Later on, they became a semantic map. So then we started looking at what software we wanted to use. Someone proposed Google Desktop, but it was completely uh, out of scope what we wanted to do. Then there are two smaller products, actually, which do semantic networks. That you can buy them. One is called K-Infinity, implemented in VisualWorks, based upon research at the, uh, the former GMB, now Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, and Atlas TI uh, in VSC, uh, originally developed or created at the Department of Psychology of Technical University of Berlin. None of this was um, really something we could use because the way our material was there, all this software would require to do manual copy and paste or retitle it or whatever. So it would be a whole bunch of manual steps required. So as we know Smalltalk, we just created our own software. We named it GH Bach Nets, uh, Nets is Network. And um, that was re developed according to the requirements of the project. As you be do it whenever you do a smaller project, you always do it that way. So the basic idea was to get, and that's also a typical small talk, to get a direct connection between the automatic procedures run on the computer and human decision taking. So when a new question came up, a new model was needed, we implemented it. When new data showed up, in the networks, we got more questions, we did a different implementation. And specifically, we had to do interesting matching because all that handwritten data was full of errors. And we actually found out that they cheated, that the, the public accountant cheated the city. So the sums were not. Well, you can't pursue it anymore, it's dead. <laughs> or, or you just couldn't, couldn't do that. I don't know. So, um, um, the network, I will, I will show you the network later on because it's a seaside application, so they can even access to it from here. And it uses SVG to demo graphical stuff. And so the software was developed parallel to usage. And uh, based on um, visual works, that was the first step to do because we had to get the data in. We used ComConnect to get from Excel and from Word all the data in. So we actually enhanced ComConnect. So we want to find it. Visual Works 7.6 was inspired by this project. Uh, Seaside to put it on the web. And uh, then it turned out that the mass could be handled in a single image. And we needed some sort of persistency. So we went to Gemstone, and uh, Gemstone was a solution to do that. And do it naively, we had the same problems as we, every Gemstone project has, we, well, it became too slow, so we had to improve it. And a couple of phone calls to Monty improved it by a factor of 10,000. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it went from hours to some seconds, so that really helped. And uh, the, the entire thing was to have, um, relationships and uh, information made available which is hidden in mountains of letters and characters, uh, characters and numbers and figures. And um, yeah, I spoke already about this. One thing I want to point out, to do the searching, we uh, went back to the winner of the Java Spectrum Dynamic Languages shootout of uh, earlier this year. We had implemented in this, this, uh, based upon tries or trees, a uh, text searching thing. Trees is an algorithm defined in 1959, I think, if I'm correct, and which does fast search. And we took this and ported this from Visual Works to Gemstone and used it for the searching purpose. And uh, to do the semantic network, uh, we thought about why are these people, so if you look on the magic networks, you have a bunch of other stuff, but the real product are all in smart You can ask yourself why. And the reason is pretty, pretty straightforward. They don't tell you, but, but we found out when we thought about what a notion would be. In this case, they use German names. They are sort of classes. They are sort of behaviors because 
These are things that can have instances which can have instances. So uh, that turned out that we first started off with a surplus of behavior, but behavior was too weak. Uh, so we didn't have enough structure, so we went to a surplus of clusters. And that's something you can do in Smalltalk and Smalltalk only. And I didn't ask the question, but uh, Vasily and um, uh, Praha Group will certainly have played with similar technologies in Squeak. Squeak has the same feature as Visual Workspace in this respect, and played around that their classes are similar to uh, smaller classes, but not the same thing. And you can do this, and we had to do this also here. And the class comment says, it is light and, like a meta object and can have instances that are concrete and represent certain objects. So look, you have the, a certain notion can be a person, and then you can have instances of person, of people, which is a single person. These are, this is the same thing. And um, subclass of this is uh, relation and value, which are just, value is just a single representation of a single value, and the relation is the connection between two or more other notions. Um, so we use the sister class of class and class description. And when it came to the point where we wanted to bring this to Gemstone, Gemstone said, oh, you can't do that. So uh, we then had to decide that the network cannot live in Gemstone. So in Gemstone, we created network descriptions. So that the persistent model, like you would do in a relational database, the persistent representation of a complete network is the representation object, and that sits in Gemstone. And when it's being brought back, the real network, the real semantic network is created of the, of the visual website. Something we found very, very needed is the problem of time. So when you go to these semantic networks, you always have the idea that if you say, this Bach lived in this house, it, that's useless information. You must say, he lived in this house from this moment to that moment. Or a person is born on that day and died on the other. So always have to do something with temporal time, uh, with temporal objects, and those, those temporal objects can be sharp or not sharp. So, so the thing, how concrete you are, you can say something happened in the 18th century, or something happened on the 16th of May, um, 1520, and uh, that's still sharp because it could happen at two o'clock in the afternoon. And then it depends on whether you want the Gregorian or the Julianian calendar. Okay, so uh, point in time is something very, very complicated, but it's very, very needed to really do something about it. So we looked to get a data collection of all inhabitants and homes in Kurt. Started off with the text thread, which is the text register, property text, and a few a sketch of the city, a list from 1855, a detailed plan from 1885, another detailed plan from 2003, and a homage list of a certain day. And all this thing was brought together. And at the end, we had a full list of all the inhabitants only one person per family, not, 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 good, not wives and not children, um, of 1716. So these are the tax kinds people have to pay. I don't translate this for you because this, the, that one before last is about the right to brew beer. So every, every second house had the right to brew beer. And so we started off with the text files copied them manually into Excel tables, used the fancy version of VisualWorks 7.6 of CompConnect, put it into VisualWorks, made it a semantic network, used a Seaside Mondrian and SVG to present it, and had a UI for the research. So these are uh, the pictures. That's an original page, and this is just one page of a book and the book is per year, and we did 100 books, and each book is less thick. So you can imagine it's that amount of books. 
And you can read all of this, of course, immediately, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you're measuring books in terms, the amount of volumes in terms of meters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and this is the same thing in, uh, in an Excel table. And so this is just two tabs. So this is true. This, this was done at, the, at, the, at, at some point in time. But now the Excel, the number of pages is 100 of these tables. And at the end, this is how the information looks at the very end. Uh, that is now the information about a single home in Waldstrasse 17, a house where Bach did not live. The house has been built in 1738, although it starts with 41, but that has something to do with the taxation plans, and it gives the kind of states, the kind of taxes, and on the left-hand side, you have the, the, the relationships and the graph. I can give you a demo of it. So the sample question was, where did Johann Sebastian Bach live? We used this, this network, and we're searching for answers. So someone in the group said, look, the only thing you have to find is a letter. There's an address on the letter. Uh, this person knew that there was a postal system, and that person was connected, and uh, that the postal system is known. So uh, we even know that, know that a letter from Kürten to Erfurt, this is about 120 miles, costed $10 in those days. And this is the letter, written by Johann Sebastian Bach to the city of Erfurt. That is the word yeah. here. And there you see the price. Franco, zwei Kreuz, two Groschen, which is $10. And if you look at the ladder, this is the address. The address does not specify any street or house description. It all consists of titles. It's three lines of titles, or four lines of titles, and professions. And so is the sender, which is this part. And Hochfürstlicher Kammermusikmeister Johann Sebastian Bach. So you see the name, the profession, but no address. So that didn't help. So we had to go back to the list of homes, and there were actually two sets of homes. One that were called to be in the city, and they were due to taxes, and the others, which were owned by the prince. And uh, the homes by the prince were rented to the home owners, and we could find both records. So one in one archive, we found all the taxations for one sort of houses, and we found the original of the renting records in another archive. They all did. So and the question is, does the name Bach show up? No. If it would have, if we knew this when we started, uh, because if it would be there, uh, someone else would have found it. In 120 years, someone would have found the name. And um, so, but we can, can certainly can conclude that Bach was neither an owner of a house in the city, nor a renter from a house from the prince. So he must have lived somewhere else. And uh, so he was a renter like his predecessor. For his predecessor, the house is known because there's a record that gives the um, yeah, the, the address. So this is uh, the oldest picture we have from Kürten from 1650. And that gives a view, but doesn't help for our problem. The oldest city map is in the museum of Kürtim, and this is it. It's only five years, uh, seven years after Bach left the city. And the question is, is it still accurate in some sense? So uh, you, if you go to the center, actually this, uh, this, this map is directed toward the north, which is not normal with maps of those days. That's why the up arrow is down here. It tells you that the north is there. And uh, so this is the center of the city. And this is how the same area looks in Google Maps. 
on Google Earth, and if you map them to one or the other, you find uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of a difference, but the basic things are the same. So there is not much of a difference in the structure between the early 18th century and now. So today's streets are pretty much the same as they were. I personally prefer then, after I found out that there's not much change with this map, this is, by the way, turned around. Now the north is down there because it's clearer and nicer and easier to work with. This is the center. And um, the question is, ah, okay. So there is an old wall which was uh, in place. So during the time when Bach lived in Curtin, the city was enlarged to the east side that's over here, it was, that wall was taken over to here. And on the west side, that wall was taken over to there. So, but this is the old wall. So when Bach came, the old wall was still in place. So what are the facts we knew from literature? Bach must have had a spacious home. First of all, he had a big family. Second, external student lived with him. And there is a record available that gives the number of cars that were needed when he moved from Kürten to Leipzig. Seven big vans with horses were used to get all his luggage. And uh, the last thing is that Hofkapelle Kürten, which was the group that made the music, 18, 18 musicians ex did their exercises in the Bach Hall. So we looked at all potential homes that someone in literature had mentioned. And these are the list of homes. Now the same map as before, where you see the houses in here, you see that there are, these are potential homes. Uh, we looked at each of them and then we asked the question, is there any other home that might have fit? So first of all, we start with this home, Burgstrasse 11, that is over here. This is how it looks now, so there's nothing there. But a year ago, there was still at least a very warm building. And uh, we could find the record that this house was built in 21, which is definitely too late that Bach would have lived there. And it was a pretty small house. Now look at this one, that's the second candidate. And still today, you see it's a very, very narrow home. It was not that high in the old days, but the same width. Far too small for the activities we were speaking about. <coughs> then there is a record that gives a link between the name Bach. This is a, a photograph from 1955 under the name Erhard. And that one, the line above, is this home. Now it's a shop. <laughs> Definitely you can see it's not the original home anymore. It's something from the GDR times. But um, that wouldn't disturb us. But we found out that there were that this house had many, many, many apartments. Though, so there were six or seven different families living in that house. And could you imagine that having a house with seven families and having a music being exercised every other day? That wouldn't fit either. So that home wouldn't work. The same is true for this home, which is very, was very small in the old days. And for that home, it's a long story. And uh, uh, we analyzed that that home, which was, and even there's a sign that says, probable Bach home, it says over there. That's a sign, that sign over there is at the, at the location. And um, that was hard because famous historians claimed that was the Bach home. And it turned out that they had, we had to find the, play, the, the logic arguments, and we used um, a bibliometric analysis uh, to find out how they were, how the arguments they brought out were wrong. And the basic thing was that the, they said, I'm astonished to find this document, and that must be true. And the astonishment was just, vain because the original author in 1900 knew that document and we could tr find out 
that he must have known the document. So someone writes something of a document. They can't find the document for 50 years anymore. And someone else finds it again. Okay, what's the surprise that the document exists? Okay, it exists, but nothing really spectacular. But that's what they thought. <coughs> and this is, uh, so no reason to be surprised. So there remain only three homes that are owned by the same person, called Johann Andreas Lautsch. The others are gone now. And uh, this is the one, actually, this is a brand new building, but it doesn't matter. And that's the home where Bach, uh, where Lautsch had his, um, he was uh, selling cloth and um, um, other stuff, so he was a trader. And he had a shop there. And having a shop and doing music in the same house wouldn't fit either. So that can't be the house. This one is more interesting. So actually, again, a 1969 building, erected to the 20th anniversary of the GDR. And uh, it well, had a different number before. And it has this owner, and it was traded after. Uh, was inherited by the son and from the son to another person who bought it from the uh, inheritance of the son. It is uh, in number 88 in the list of uh, the area of Napoleon. It's one of the largest homes in the entire city. Only six homes had to pay more property tax, $265 a year. And uh, so it's now to be a very big home. This is a, a, draw, a, a picture from 1884 showing the home, how it was and looked when uh, Bach lived there. And uh, it's really, this is how it looks now. And uh, there is a story that Bach complained that next to his home was a water mill. And the rattle of the water mill disturbed his music. In fact, there is a water. There was a water mill next door to it. Not really next door. Maybe 150, 60 yards from there. And um, we know for a fact that his predecessor, Augustin Stricker, exercised there because the homeowner got <coughs> the rent from the prince. And after Bach came there, Bach got the same rent from the, the same amount of money to give to the homeowner. So um, it's reported that he lived in the same home as the exercises were in, and he had found the Bach home, but only the first one. Then he moved to this building. And um, there's a document also saying <coughs> So it, this has been described in literature. So some people said, yes, it is. Others said, it can't be. And uh, so it has been going back and forth to the mid of the 20th century. And someone gave the argument, the, built has, the house has been built in 1729. So it drops out of the list irrevocably. The problem is, his argument is wrong. And the home is not built, it's not been built in. 1729, it has been built in 1719, so the two is wrong. So this street, the Wall Street, is much older than uh, 1779. It was the, uh, so it was outside of the city wall, the connection between two suburbs. So when the doors were closed, people still wanted to move from one suburb to the other outside, and that was there was a trail there. And they had built a um, um, gold and silver fiber manufactory there. And the rest were gardens rented from the prince to wealthy citizens. And on the 17th, 27th February 1719, Prince Leopold took the decision to enlarge the city and to build Wall Street and School Street, um, according um, and today's uh, Bach um, 
square as a city extension. And to build a new city wall around it. And he took the decision that this street would be tax exempt as long as not all homes were built. And as all tax rules have interesting consequences, not today, even in those days, that last rule, which should encourage people to move there, did exactly the contrary. Because there were rich people living there. So a few moved in, and then they said, no, we will do everything we can, then not all land parcels will be in houses, because when they get houses, we have to pay taxes. So there was a plan in the, we found this plan in the, in the, in the, in the act that gives all the name of the owners. And you see also the name Louch over there. And you, if you see closely, this is the old kind of way it was. And then they decided to put the, the, the road pretty straight. And that's typical for, bar, for Baroque times. And you have this straight watching roads something that has been traded to the United States, where like it's, in big cities you have straight roads. And that was, before that, not, no roads were straight, before the 1800s, uh, not the 1700s. So this is a typical uh, Baroque city arrangement. And um, 10 years later, when Prince Leopold was dead and his brother became prince, he decided to change the, the exemption rule and new buildings would only be three years tax exempt, and you immediately find the buildings in the tax list. And at that time, there is another list that gives which building has been built. You can see this is not built, that one is not built, there's a, yeah, something not built, this is not built, and that's it. The rest was built. So uh, something that really indicates what was going on. Now is the question, can we find out any indication when the homes were built because we have no expert data. And now the semantic network should answer the question, when did Poopa people move there? And it does, actually. So we didn't do it at an, uh, the, the home where Bach lived could not be traced because uh, Johann Andreas Lauch did not, did not move. He just built the house, paid taxes for it later, and someone else moved in. So, but for this particular house, we know taxation started in 1730, but we can trace back that it was built in 1719. And we did it that way, that we went to the first owner, and this is actually taken, that this is, this is a live picture from, not really live, it's, it's a screenshot from the, uh, from the network. We see, that the, that the guy who moved in, in 1730, had, a, had another home in Kleiner Plan 2, and moved, paid taxes until 1719 at the other location. So we know, and you can have one more picture that shows that that house had a different owner, not with the name of Nikola Schneider, in 1720. So, and from that information we know that in 1719, 1720 time frame, that um, Feinrad Hübert moved from Kleinerplan 2 to Schutzstraße 19. And now we know that the homes were built in 1719, and that was in the middle of the time when Bach lived in. That's very important information. And um, so we moved on and got the information, and then we found out Another piece of thing, people said the bill house was built in 1712. And that's also erroneous. So and what we had to do, we had all these pieces of information, and they were all sort of correct. So there was some correct information in it, and you have to find the distinction between truth and untruth. And for this particular case, so one guy said 1729, the other one said 1712. And they both were misinterpreting characters. So if you look at this list, 27, 28, 29, 30, the, the two and the nine are pretty, pretty similar. I thought they just misinterpreted a nine as a two. 
So the correct number is 1719. And we know from this that this home is a drawing from the home uh, built by Johan by, um, Andreas Lauch and that Johann Sebastian Bach moved there. And uh, when he moved there, the, the money he got to do the exercises in his home immediately stopped because for this home he didn't need a subsidization for uh, his exercises. Uh, when you look at the, another little thing we found, uh, you remember I had this name Bach associated with Erhard, and you find the name Erhard again in another list. Okay, in this house also, this house was owned by a different person called Erhard. So there is another hint that this is a correct solution. And um, so at the end we know, or we assume, we had a very high probability that there are two, that the two houses of, you know, of Lauch are the two Bach homes. We found many positive hints that Johann Sebastian Bach lived there and now refutable negative statements. So initially he lived in this building and when the same owner built the other building, he, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach moved in. And now, come back to our organization. This is, you saw the picture before, this is the Bach house, and this is the house where our office is. So it's only two houses in between. Uh, for those who were at ESA uh, four years ago, you probably walked through the city, and on this square over there, that's where you find the Bach. So that's my story about finding the Bach house. What I can do for you um, is show the, uh, the software life Internet Explorer because Internet Explorer does not do SVG. So this is the software. And the best way to do show SVG <coughs> is uh, using um, Safari, even the new version of Firefox does not factory do uh, SVG, so two tips don't work there, and clicking doesn't work that way, or at least we couldn't make it work. Um, so I locked in the system. Hmm. Okay, this is the interface for searching. So for example, I look for no search. Now uh, the searching goes on and brings us three lists. This is the list of the literature. And uh, it only shows it has about 40 hints, like you would expect in Google. This is the list of names it found. And there are five names it found. And we click on one. And if the name would be on show, an author, it would be shown also there. And this is now the network we were speaking about. So uh, this is now the home. This is the person. This is the home, Bajrasse 25. This is the home. Guttermark 3, and this is the home, Schalange Straße 42, and over here is all the data. If I click on here, on here I can, I, I, you see it's highlighting there, so there's a seaside connection and JavaScript connection with top three things. <coughs> and um, so this is a live seaside application showing the data. We could also go back to the so this is all in German, so I don't have a good server too much. So, but um, um, people are convinced that uh, this way of searching it. May, some people just doubt and say you don't find find the piece of paper that you look for. You will find it. Uh, 
and um, there you can see it's seaside. <laughs> <laughs> So I just wanted to show quite Alan. Okay. So um, so that's the way to show the the original data. Questions? Was it a surprise to you to find that you were that close? Yeah. <laughs> So when we bought the home uh, a couple of years ago and we renovated it, we, we were not thinking about uh, that half lift two doors away. So we actually found who had built, not the building we are in, the building we are in, it's clearly Art Deco, it's 1911, but who was the original owner and all that person's history we found by accident also because I just typed in uh, that address and found it was built by a doctor and I found even the life of the person because it was scanned somewhere else when they did his thesis, what his profession was, who he married uh, and that his uh, father-in-law was the former mayor of the city and that's why they had this wonderful garden. It still is wonderful. Okay, so uh, this is a, uh, I want to just show you this. So you see the original scan document, that's the way we do it. Andreas. Yeah, uh, is there any information about you in there? Since you live there now? So, as this is gemstone, every time a new question is put in, it takes a little bit longer because of uh, caching problems. And it's not on a, dis on a deliberate hardware uh, because we, they just put it on the, on the workstation of uh, Carson. And actually, I'm in there. <laughs> so this is a mail I sent, so it's my mail address, which gives some information. This is uh, the report about the project. So it's actually, uh, but nothing which would be unknown to me. Did it help your piano playing? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, actually more the, you know, the, the playing of the kids. Ah, good. Are you going to try to find the Holy Grail now? Or? <laughs> <laughs> if someone pays us to do so. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you describe um, the, the size of the themes that will be here, have both in programming and in research? How many people? Uh, Thirty. Both of them, uh, no, all of them part time, or well, most of them part time, except for the data collectors. They were pretty full time. Uh, so, um, uh, and there were all kinds of. I, all of that book transcription was done by what thirty it? people. All of that book transcription was done by only thirty people. Yeah. Most of us were just scanning. So, so the trans this. Uh, is that, uh, yeah, but all that handwritten stuff in those The handwritten stuff was not too many pages. There was maybe 600 or 800 pages that were. <laughs> yeah. The most, the most words were uh, typing the, the, the text records. Yeah. There were three people for 100 days each. So something like 1.5 million years. <laughs> It turns out to be that while Bach was living in that city, he was also a, a very good friend of this guy called Silverman. And Silverman is a renowned organ builder. I know. And it so happens to be that this guy Silverman got a 
translation into German from Italian of this book, uh, uh, an interview actually, to this guy that had invented the piano, only nobody had paid attention to him. And Silverman built a piano. Well, I think more or less at the time this is going on. So do you have anything about Silverman? With a, a B, uh, the large one, the large one, or whatever. <coughs> I don't know. Maybe that's good to attract more tourists. <laughs> and there should be two. Uh, there was Andreas and I think Johan. And it was not Andreas who did the piano stuff. Still searching? Somewhere we could. There's some information about Silverman, actually 50 documents. Uh, I can't quite read. The, so what's the name? Is, is it Andreas or the other one? Uh, that is, the first one uh, speaks about Silverman in uh, Naumburg. It's Silverman organ, organ in Naumburg. Oh, <laughs> nice. I like he it. knew Silverman and spoke to him and your organ are wonderful, but he didn't give the first name of Silverman. Ah. Um, no, that's a different one. Gottfried. Yes, thank you. That's that's a guy. Gottfried Silverman. Yes, so. And actually it's funny, he built a piano. The first one Bach didn't like and told him, no, 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 this is garbage, go away. <laughs> but the second one he made, Bach approved. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, in part, that's why we have pianos today. And the music I played up front is known to be written in, uh, in Köthen. Um, maybe I just, in about 15 minutes, there will be the seaside bar here in the room, and if there are not any more questions, I will play to you another piece. From the... I think if there are no more questions, there will certainly be some applause. You know. <laughs>